بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله One of the companions by the name of Usaid رضي الله عن he was reading the Quran in his house during the night prayer reading from Surah Al-Kahf and he noticed that his horse started to shake and started to move in a very strange manner, so much so that it was about to break away from the ropes that it was tied to. And he feared that the horse would trample his, his children. So he stopped reading the Quran and he went the next day and told our beloved Prophet وسلم, about the story, about the story of what had happened to him. And the Prophet وسلم, he said that this is the sakina that was sent down with the Qur'an. This is the tranquility that was sent down with the Qur'an. And this is a reminder to us of the power of the Qur'an and of the power of this surah, Surah Al-Kahf. Many times when we reflect on Surah Al-Kahf, we immediately go right away to the virtues and the reward that we get for reading Surah Al-Kahf. In fact, I can guarantee that hands down, the majority of us who read Surah Al-Kahf every Friday, we do it because it's Sunnah, but we're looking for the ajr, for the reward. And what is the reward from reading Surah Al-Kahf every Friday? What do we get in return when we read Surah Al-Kahf every Friday? What did the Prophet والسلام, say about it? That whoever recites Surah Al-Kahf on Jum'ah, on Friday, that a light will shine from beneath his feet uh, uh, to the clouds of the sky. Different narrations, and even the scholars, they differed about these narrations, are they authentic or not? But inshallah, perhaps that they're hasan, that they're a sound narration, or this one anyways, inshallah ta'ala. So this is one of the great rewards that we get from reading Surah Al-Kahf. Also, we know the general hadith about whoever memorizes the first 10 verses from Surah Al-Kahf. What does he get in return? Another narration it's the last 10, but in Sahih Muslim, it's the first 10. The first 10 verses, whoever memorizes them, what does he get in return? A protection from the Dajjal. And what's meant by this, obviously, is not just memorizing it, but memorizing it and understanding the meanings and acting upon them. This is the objective of the Quran. It's for us to try to understand the meanings and then to act upon them and to put them into action. Surah Al-Kahf, there's something very interesting about the title of this surah. Where do we take the title from? We learned it obviously from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who used to call it this name, Surah Al-Kahf. Also we know the story inside about the group of men when they ran away to protect their religion and they went and they hid and stayed in the Kahf. And this, this is their story, one of the main stories of this surah. But there's something very interesting about this surah and one of the main objectives of this surah is that it talks about the main fitness and trials and tribulations that we might find in everyday life. And the scholars said, this is amazing because what this is, this kaf, it's the cave, it's a place of safety. Just like if you're traveling and you're looking for a place to protect yourself, to sleep during the night, you might have to go into a cave in order to find protection. So this surah, is your protection to protect you from the fitness, from the trials and the tribula tribulations and the difficulties that you might find in everyday, everyday life. Therefore, it's as if every week, once a week, we're entering to our cave of safety to remind ourselves about these things that we might face in life and how to protect ourselves from them. What are the main fitness that are mentioned in this Quran and in, in this surah, the main trials and tribulations. If you look, many people look at the four main stories. And before we mention them, we're going to mention some of the other objectives of this surah as well, some of the main objectives. And then we'll talk about uh, what we gain, inshallah, from the stories. From the main objectives of this surah, obviously, as we mentioned, how to deal with these trials and tribulations and to remind ourselves of them. Because when you're aware that something might come like this, you're prepared. Uh -huh. It happened to me now. So now you know how to deal with it and you're expecting that it might come. Also one of the main objectives of this surah is 
the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll notice when you look into the surah in the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about his Tawheed, the issue of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not joining partners in the danger of shirk. And it's a warning to those who claimed that Allah took a son. Warning about the shirk and the dangers of shirk. And at the end of the surah, إِنَّمَا إِلَهُكُمْ إِلَهُ وَاحِدٌ From this verse, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about it, indeed, your Lord is one Lord, one ilah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it starts with the issue of tawheed and it ends with the issue of tawheed. Also, if you focus on the meanings in the surah, it also goes into detail in several aspects of the tawheed. The oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his right to be worshipped, and staying away from what contradicts that, joining partners, making shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, it talks about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us, أَفَحَسِبَتَ أَنَّ أَصْحَابَ الْكَهْفِ وَالرَّقِيمِ كَانُوا مِنْ آيَاتِنَا عَجَبًا You think this story about these people of the Kahf and the Raqib, that it was something amazing. It's an amazing story, but what Allah is telling us to reflect on in this verse is that the other things from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are actually greater. If you look at ourselves, the creation of the human being, it's greater than the story of the people of the Kahf. If you look at the heavens and the earth, the sun, the moon, all of these creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of them are greater than that of the story of the people of the Kahf as well. This is what Allah is reminding us of, is His greatness. And when He reminds us of His greatness, it reminds us of, his, of our right upon Him to worship Him and to obey Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, it talks in detail in several verses throughout the surah about the ba'ath, about the resurrection and returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being held accountable for our deeds. And also in the beginning, obviously, talking about the Qur'an and the objectives of the Qur'an is also one of the themes or the themes of this great surah. When we talk about the fitness, the trials and tribulations that are mentioned in the stories of this surah, the main stories. The main stories in the surah, how many are there? Four of, four of them, four stories. Four stories. What is the first story? The people of the cave. What was the main fitna that was being talked about in this story? The main test. The fitna that can come to what? To your deen and to your religion. And how to protect yourself if this happens. The second story, what is it? The, 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 the men with the two gardens. Talking about the men with the, with the two gardens. The two men with the two gardens. So this is talking about what? The, the fitna of wealth, the fitna of money. And the third Story is what story? The story of Musa and Khidr, alayhima as-salam. And this is talking about what? The fitna of what? Knowledge. And the fourth story is the story of who? al qarnain And it's talking about the fitna, the test of what? Of power and authority if someone is a leader. This is what, these are the main stories of the Quran, of this, of this surah, and these are the main tests and the fitness that are mentioned in each one of these stories. However, there are other fitness as well. If you were to look at the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that the greatest fitna for us, for the men, what is it? Women, the fitna of women. Is it the greatest fitna, Shabab? Uh, for most men it is. But it's not mentioned in the surah or is it mentioned in the surah? Pay attention. Say this now is mentioned. They say these, we always hear the scholars talking about these are the greatest four tests, the fitness that you can be tested with in these four stories. But we know from the sunnah of our beloved Prophet, وسلم, that he said that the greatest test for men is women. So it's not mentioned in these four stories, or is it? It is. Where? It's mentioned, maybe not directly, but indirectly. Where? Talking about what? About money, about the wealth. If you have money, you get honey, huh? <laughs> That's it. It becomes a fitna. If you have money, then you're going to get women. Most of the men who are tested with women, he's the one who has what? Who has money or has fame or, 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 or both of them. 
And you'll find that someone, he might be a good brother, he might be a handsome brother, but he doesn't have a lot of fitna with women because he's broke and he's poor. No one knows who he is. So he doesn't have the same type of fitna. Where if someone is famous, someone has money, then he's going to be someone who, what, who, has, who is tested with the, this test of women. So it isn't included. There's other tests actually in the surah as well. If you were to take some time as you read it on Fridays to reflect. One of them, for example, is the test of being oppressed of the dhulm that can happen to you, uh, especially when it comes from the hukam, from certain rulers. What if you're in an oppressed situation? Then what should you do? Because the fitna of religion that we talked about in the, in the story of the people of the Kaf, actually, it starts from where? From the oppressive nature of their ruler. And this is very significant in the days that we live in, as we see now what's happening, for example, to our brothers in India. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help them and protect them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And we see all around the world. This is, that's just the latest example that we mention here now. <coughs> so here it's telling us some of the ways that we can deal with this. Maybe it's not always the best way, but this obviously is one of the solutions to that problem, which is to what? To run away with your religion and to protect yourself and to stay away from the places of fitna. So the issue of being oppressed. Also the, the fitna of the dunya itself. And even though that can fall into wealth, but when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the ard, and that he's made it zina, this earth that he's made, the, the dormants, it's a beautiful place. So the fitna of the dunya, it can distract people in different ways. It's not necessarily always money. People could be distracted by other things of the dunya as well. So that's one of the things mentioned. Also, the test and the fitna of the society which, that you live in. Because most societies around the world, is also in the story of the people of the kaf as well, of the cave, most societies around the world, do they call us to do good? Most of, it, most of them don't. Is there a lot of ways to make us go astray from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to fall into haram? Is it more easier to fall into haram than it is to do that which is good? Subhanallah. This is the reality of the most societies in the world. So this surah comes weekly to remind us of the fitna that we are going to face and how we can protect ourselves, inshallah ta'ala, from the fitna of the society that we live in. Also, one of the issues of the company that we keep. Who it has to be and who we have to stay away from. In which verse? In general, keeping good company, we can take it from the people of the cave, from their story. But what, what, what is the verse Allah says towards the end of their story? Waspir nafsika. Have you make yourself patient with who? Alladhina yad'oona rabbahum bil ghadati wal ashi yuriduna wajha. With those who are making dua to Allah night and day, they want the face of Allah. They're striving for Allah. They want Allah to be pleased with them. They want Allah to accept from them. Uh, so these are the people you have to be with. Uh, Allah told them, don't let, don't let them go far away from you. Keep them close to you. And then he told us, And be aware, don't follow those who follow their desires. Those who have gone astray and their hearts have gone astray. Beware of these people. Don't be with these people. Don't obey them. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about the danger and the test that we, taste, uh, that we face about who we deal with and the company that we keep. Also one of the things, the trials that we gain, when you go back to the story of the two men in the, with the gardens, we mentioned from that the issue of wealth, of money, and also the issue of women which comes with that. Also the issue of being in with the in crowd, of being popular, of being famous, all of that. Because one of the things he mentioned, or two, the two things he mentioned when he was boasting and was arrogant towards his friend, what did he say to him? And we always focus on the first part about the issue of, of the mal, of the money. But he said also, I have more supporters, I have more followers, I have more people around me than you. I'm someone who's important. I'm VIP. When I come, people come to give me salams. People come to spend time with me. Nobody hangs out with you. You're a loser. This is basically what he's telling his friend, right? So this is one of the things now. It's a fitna for him who has the following, but it's also a fitna for the ones following as well. What happens now if someone famous comes here to give a talk? Mufti Mink, when he comes to Qatar, what does everybody want to do? If they can get close enough with him, they get the selfie, they want to get it. Huh? If they can't get it, Facebook Live. I'm at the Mufti Mink lecture. 
Huh? This is what everybody does, right? And they want to show the people that I'm, I'm with someone who's important. If someone goes and he, oh, you guys were at a lesson last night on, on Thursday night? Well, I was with, I was actually with the Amir, you know, I was having dinner and we were talking about some things. Or I was with, you know, the, the businessman so-and-so who owns this and this and this. I was with so-and-so and so-and-so. Actually, there was a football player who came in and I, the, or the, the movie star, you know, you know, the famous guy on TV. I was, I was actually having dinner with him when you guys were in the lesson. So this becomes a fitna for all of the people as well. And also the fitna of a shaytan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the one verse when he refused to make sujood Adam, And Allah asks us the question, because he said he, he went away from the command of Allah. He's the only one who refused to make sujood. And Allah says to us, So you take him and his offspring as supporters for you. And they are your clear enemy, subhanAllah. Allah wants us to think, you're your enemy and you're taking them and you're following them, subhanAllah. This is also one of the fitness and the challenges. If you look at these four stories mentioned in the Quran, something amazing, when we reflect on them, that the foundation of any successful society, all of them go back to these four elements or these th four things in the story. So if you look, for example, the first story, you have a group of brothers who come together and they have what? Teamwork. Also, they're very organized. They have a strategic plan. Any society that's going to be successful, we have to have strategic plans. The countries had their 2020 vision. Now they have their 2030 vision. And this is how, how people plant. And the story of the people of the, of the Kahf, of the cave, very strategically planned. Also, they work together. They had teamwork. And any society needs this. The second story, what was it? About money and wealth. If you want your society to be successful, any country, any society, you need money to make things happen. And also the issue of knowledge, one of the key things. <coughs> and that's why the schooling system is so bad in every country in the world, because they actually don't want the societies to be successful. Otherwise, they would change it. It's been a broken system for 100 years plus, and they still teach us the same way and the same things, teaching us we have no benefit in our lives. But the key thing is that the people stay have a little bit of knowledge, but not really what benefits them. And that's the objectives of most societies in the world. The point is, is that if we want a, success, a successful society, then it has to be built upon knowledge. And the fourth thing goes back to the issue of the government and the importance of justice and establishing justice from the government. And this is the foundation of every society. If we look into the story of the people of the cave, and he's something amazing, it's a map to success. If you follow their story step by step and just reflect on it, it shows you if you want to be successful, what is the criteria? What do you need to do? The first thing starts with what? It starts with the true belief and the correct aqidah. And everything always comes back to the true meaning of la ilaha illallah, which is an implementation. Implement it. Not just something that we talk about on our tongues and say it's in our hearts but something that has to show up in actions. And that's what we gain also from this story, that automatically, when someone becomes a true believer and has true iman and strong iman, that it's going to put him into action. So these individuals, what happened when they believed in their Lord? What did Allah give them in return? Huh? And we were, after they believed, this young group of youngsters, they believed, Allah said, and we increased them in huda. We increase them in guidance. And what is huda? It's practicing. It's implementing. It's implementing the deen. Not just talking about it. It was the iman that started in the heart, a belief system that then turned into actions. And that's why as well, you're going to see when they stand up and they tell them what they believe in. Also, it leads to bravery, as we'll mention in a minute. Something very interesting, when you look at some of the first surahs that came down to the Prophet, والسلام, it also shows us some of the keys. Because one of the objectives of the people of the cave was for them to go to the cave to train themselves and to be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly without any hardships and any problems. The first surah revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was what? Iqra. Starts with knowledge. Later surahs that came to him in the early stage of Mecca right away, Surah Al-Muzammil. What is Surah Al-Muzammil talking about? <coughs> about now. So Al-Muzammal is talking about ibadah, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the night prayer, the impact of the Qur'an. This is what, this is what the Surah Al-Muzammal is focused on. Then Surah Al-Mudathir, which you mentioned, then it, what happens, 
right away into action, da'wah, and, and, and standing up and giving da'wah. So these individuals in the story of the cave, we said that once you have true iman and it's put into action, then what happens? You become brave because you know you're upon the haqq. Any person who knows they're upon the, the haqq, they're upon the truth, they're going to be brave. They're going to stand in front of difficulties and they're going to be able to embrace it. In fact, then many times they'll be able to enjoy it and find ladha and find pleasure in it. Even if they're going through difficulties, sometimes even if they're going through torture, subhanAllah. Because they're doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they know the haqq and it's something that's rooted in their heart, subhanAllah. That's why these individuals, what did Allah say about them? First of all, because they put their iman into action, what did Allah do, to do for them? وَرَبَطْنَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made their hearts firm. You want your heart to be firm? You want to remain upon the haqq? Start with true iman, strong iman that is illustrated in your actions. And then in return, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep you firm. When they stood up in front of their ruler, who was a tyrant, what did they say to him? Without any hesitation, with all the pride in their hearts, they said, Rabbuna, Rabbus samawati wal ard. That our Lord is the Rabb of the heavens and the earth. And then what did they say? Lan min dunihi ahada. That we'll never call from any, we will never call on anyone else other than him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also what we gain, and so this is something interesting from this, if you look at the next verse that comes after that, what do they talk about? Here they're talking about what their belief is. They affirm what? La ilaha illallah. That we only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the only one deserving of worship. And then they say, That these are our people they took from other than Allah, acts of the other, other idols to be worshipped, other gods to be worshipped, other deities that are worshipped. And they free themselves from them. And this is the true meaning of La ilaha Allah, which is based on Wala and Bara. That we follow La ilaha Allah, that we follow and affirm the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our allegiance to this meaning. And we free ourselves from those who join partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you look at these individuals, before they didn't just, they didn't act upon emotions. And this is a very important lesson for all of us that many of the youth fall into it especially. Once you start to get experience and you start to learn, then things change. But sometimes some of our youth, they fall into mistakes even though they're very passionate and they have a a, a genuine love for Islam, but they fall into mistakes because they act upon on, on passion and they're sometimes overzealous and they're not focusing on the bigger picture. They just act and then, oh, that wasn't a good idea. We should have done it a different way. You come a few years later, I, I, I don't have, I, they don't have knowledge sometimes. So there's many reasons why they're falling into different mistakes. But these individuals, if you look at them, they had a very strategic plan, which was for them to what? To leave the city. They had the main objective, we said, was their tarbiyah, their training, educating themselves, and to be able to worship Allah freely. They realized that in a society that is based upon jahiliyyah and ignorance, they're not going to be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a society where there's a tyrant leader, that they're not going to find their freedom to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, therefore they decided to migrate and to, find the uh, to seclude themselves in a place where they could freely learn their religion, and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in order for them to do that, there's certain things that they're going to need from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First of all, they need to rely on Allah, the tawakkul. But what is real tawakkul? When the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, when he made hijrah, who ordered him to make hijrah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But look at all the precautions and all of the planning and preparation that he did alayhi salatu wasalam, in order to make sure that the hijrah went properly, subhanAllah. These individuals, if you look at the verse, if you're going to what? Withdraw from your people. And with that which they worship, if you're going to withdraw from, from these people, then you need to what? And go to the calf. What's going to get in return? So here they're going to the calf. And they're going to put their reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're going to go to freely worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're going to retreat to the cave. 
What do they say at the end of the verse? What's going to happen in return? If you go for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's going to, what is Allah going to do for you? Yanshur lakum rabbukum mir rahmatihi. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you from his mercy. Because once they go into the cave, there's two main components that they need. There's two main components that they need in order to be successful in the, when they're in the cave. The rahmah that Allah puts between them so they can trust one another. They can be strong with each other. And then they're going to need the provisions in order to survive. And that's what the next one comes. That Allah will make and prepare for you from that which you need to facilitate for you. The means that you need to be successful. So they had a strategic plan. Also one of the things that the scholars mentioned when you reflect on this, the issue of the number. How many of them were there? Was, was there a big number or sm were there a big number or a small number? We don't know the exact number, but it comes in the verses which come. Were they, were they, was there three of them and the dog was the fourth? Were there, were there five of them and the dog was the sixth? Seven and eight, as Ibn Abbas, he said, this is the correct opinion. So let's take that opinion that it's seven. So they're a small number. They can m move easily. They can go without be, uh, being unseen. But if it's 200 people, all of them migrating, it's going to be more obvious. So here they have to have a smaller group in order to be able to maneuver more properly. Also, they took many precautions. From it is they went outside of the city. Not too far. Up in a cave, obviously far away from people. But also they could go back in when they need to buy provisions and get things from the city as well. Also, who, who did they take with them? Their dog. And what is the benefit of having a dog in this situation? A watchdog. He's going to protect you. So what's, how is he going to protect you? In two different ways. First of all, if someone's coming, whether it be an animal or it be people searching for you, what's he going to do to the dog? He's going to bark. He's going to bark and let you know someone's coming or something's coming. The second thing he's going to do for you is that if you're under attack, maybe he'll come and what defend you. I saw something amazing the other day with my, with my son and my, my other children. We're in Istanbul and we're seeing the, the two young boys, they're coming with their sheep coming back home in the evening time. It was on Juma. It was actually last, last Juma, uh, before Mogrib. <coughs> so they're coming home, and we see there's like four stray dogs, big ones as well, sitting on the other side of the valley. So the dog comes. There's one, one dog who's with the herd. He sees that now the herd is in trouble. He throws himself right into battle. It was amazing. One dog against four. He just goes straight at him, you know, subhanAllah. And the young boy had to come and help him out with throwing rocks at the other dogs and things like that in order to protect the herd. But you see... That's one of the benefits of having these dogs is a sor source of protection. But there's something amazing that one of the scholars mentioned that I never thought of. And this is the benefit of us gathering and reflecting on the Quran. One of the benefits of having a dog as well, if they're going in that small group of about seven people and they have a dog with them as they're walking through the wilderness, walking through the mountains, people are going to think they're doing what? If someone sees them, are they going to look suspicious? In fact, the dog's going to help them not look suspicious. What are they, seven guys walking through the woods, walking through the mountains, what are they up to? But when they're walking with a dog, most likely, what are they doing? Hunting. Back in the day, huh? huh? They're out there hunting, and that's their hunting dog. So people are going to see them, and they're not going to look suspicious. That's also one of the benefits of having the dog with them as well. When you look into the verse which comes later, Allah mentions, وَكَذَلِكَ بَعَثْنَاهُمْ لِيَتَسَأَلُوا بَيْنَهُمْ That's when they're... Similarly, we awaken them. So they might question amongst themselves. Once again, mention the issue of the resurrection as it comes several times during the surah. If we were to stop just on this verse and just reflect on some of the things that we gain and benefit, we could actually sit here all night on this, just this verse alone. Many lessons that come in it, subhanAllah. They started to talk about different things, different, you know, how long do we stay? A day, more than a day. What did one of them say to them right away? And there's a very important lesson for all of us. Rabbukum a'lamu bima labithum. Allah knows best. How we, we, don't, we really don't know, honestly. We have no way to prove it. Is there much benefit in this right now in, 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 in determining or guessing, actually? Because we can't really determine. We can only guess how many days we've been here <coughs> or how long we've been here. So there's not much benefit in what's being said. And that's a beautiful and important lesson. Not wasting our time on things that don't come back with, with much benefit. And that's one of the lessons all throughout this surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
answering the questions that the Jews had when they asked the Prophet وسلم, about different, they told the Quraysh, ask him about these questions. Allah didn't go into some of the details because it's not really important how many they were, how long they stayed. What's really important is the lessons that we gain from their stories. Dhul Qarnayn didn't go into any detail about him, went into the detail about some of the lessons we gain from his story. That's why, or that's the objective is not the information, but the objective is what do we gain in return? What can we benefit from this story? And then we can do this in all aspects of life. Once you start to think with the Quranic vision, with the vision from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, you say, what can I gain from this? Something bad that's happening. Always there can be something positive, what you can derive from it. Now, for example, when we see what's happening to our brothers in India, what positive can we derive from it here in Doha? An easy lesson. There could be several things if we were ready to reflect. But one of the key things that pops to us right away, what is it? It's a test for them, no doubt about that. It's a test for us as well, because most of us don't do anything about it. But it reminds us of our religious freedom that we have, alhamdulillah. We're free to practice. We practice in, 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 in tranquility and in, in beautiful masajid. Alhamdulillah, we have, we have security, we have safety. We're not going through, we're not challenged like that, alhamdulillah. So what should this do in return for us right away? Should make us what? More grateful. And if you're thankful, then indeed I will increase you, Allah tells us. So right away, this should make me a better Muslim. Because of the ni'mah, the blessing that Allah gave me. Also, I know that if I want to support my brothers, if I want us as Muslims to be victorious, Allah told us in the Quran, in Tansur Allah, Yansurkum. That if you support Allah, Allah will support you. If we're not returning to our religion and supporting Allah, then Allah is not going to support us in return. When you look at the story of the two men in the gardens, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the beginning different types of business from agriculture. And even if you want to reflect deeper, the issue of the nahar that was given to him. And even if Jarna, and obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who made this river for them, but sometimes you're the one who has to open up canals and open up rivers. So also the, the, the scholars, they went and they said that this is some of the other type of you know, machinery and things like that you need to build as well. It can be taken from that, as well as the issue of having a harbor, having a port, perhaps where he imports things, where he sends his goods off as well. All of that can fall into that little part of, of, of the eye as well. The, 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 what's been mentioned, different parts of tijara, of trading, of agriculture. But what does this lead to? And this is the reality of most individuals. If they're successful, what happens to them? They become arrogant. Look what I've done. That we have the, the expression nowadays, self-made. Huh? Look, look what I did, look what I accomplished. Me, myself, and I. I did this. It was me, my hard work. And the people tend to forget what? Forget who? Forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People tend to forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what happened to this individual, and this is the danger of arrogance. That's why the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, what did he say about the kibr? Arrogance. Whoever has a what? Adam's weight. Something that small of kibr, of pride in his heart. He will not enter the jannah. Because what can it lead to? Just like what it led to in this individual's story. It led to what? It led to him disbelieving in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا أَظُنُّ السَّاعَةَ قَائِمًا I said, I don't even believe there's going to be an hour. I'm not going to be resurrected. I'm not going to go back. Nothing's going to happen. Saying that Allah doesn't exist, subhanAllah, a'udhu billah. He fell into shirk and fell into disbelief because of the success he had in the dunya. And the law reminds us, as they say, all good things always come to an end, right? The dunya, even ask any businessman, any of the brothers here or businessmen, you have your times when you're up, you have your times when you're down. It doesn't always last, subhanAllah. And this is the test. Are you going to be thankful? If you're thankful, many of the people who are thankful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always opens up other doors for them in the future and puts barakah in their risk and in their lives, inshallah ta'ala. When we go to the story of the knowledge, the third story of Musa and Khidr, all of the means to be successful in seeking and obtaining knowledge are mentioned in this story. First of all, traveling. As the scholars of Islam showed us from the early times in Islam, traveling from country to country, city to city, 
And if you really want to obtain knowledge, that's what you have to do in most cases. Because sometimes when you're in your homeland, what happens? Do you learn? You can't learn because you're busy with your work, busy with family. But if you travel to another country, maybe by yourself, you might have to leave the family behind for some time, but you'll be able, free to be able to focus on obtaining knowledge. So that's one of the things, or you could add, make them two. Traveling and going to different lands and isolating yourself as well, that could also be one of the means from traveling to benefit and to gain knowledge. Also the issue of being what? Humble. Look at the lesson that Musa taught, teaches us in this verse. How many things do we gain from what Musa said in the verse? How did he ask him if he could, if he could learn from him? Did he tell him, I'm the prophet of Allah, Musa. Allah told me to come to you and learn from you. I'm going to follow you. He could have said like this, couldn't he? Because Allah is the one who, who commanded him to go meet him. But what did he say? And what were the lessons that he gained? Hell at Can I follow you? Look at the, how polite he is, how humble he is. He's Musa, the prophet of Bani Israel. And he's asking this man, who we've never heard of before, can I follow you? What did he want to gain from him? And to Alimuni. So you can teach me. So you can be my teacher and I can be what? Your student. Now, the Musa who's teaching everyone, he's the main teacher, he's the prophet, who's teaching about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, teaching what is halal, what is haram, night and day. And now he's become again a student. Being humble is one of the keys to success if you're going to seek knowledge. Also, one of the things that's mentioned, the scholars mentioned from this that we gain, not overeating. Where do we gain this from in the story? When, when did he request his lunch or his meal? After they travel for a very long distance. So the same thing when you go to seek knowledge, sometimes you might have to leave some meals. You might have to go without eating for some time. But that's actually good for you because when you overeat, what happens? You get tired, you get lazy, and you don't become focused. Also from the things is the wara and of avoiding all types of suspicious uh, issues when it comes to the desires or the doubts, all of those things. When you look at the story of Musa and Khidr, right away when he put a hole in the, in, 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 into the ship, what did he say? He made inkar. He said he freed himself from it. He said, "That's not correct. These are masakin. These people are working. How can you mess up the ship? They let us get on the ship for free, and you're going to mess up the ship? What is this?" Then he told him he has to be patient again. And then also he told him, and he also he told him when he came and he killed the killed killed the boy. Once again, he didn't let it slide. He said, "No, it has nothing to do with me. This is your thing. I, I, how could you do something like this?" Subhanallah. And also from the things, the implementation, the intention of the tiba, and following and, and acting upon what you learn upon, and the issue of sabr and knowledge as well. Obviously, what was the key? And that's what he wanted to teach him at the end. What was the key is the issue of sabr. If you want to obtain knowledge, you have to have a lot of sabr and a lot of patience. So there's some of the keys for knowledge that are mentioned in the story. Something amazing about the, the three stories that happen, or the three things that happen to, uh, with, between Musa and Khidr, all three of them have a significance, something that happened in the life of Musa himself, like a reminder to him. What were they? When they got into the ship, what does it remind Musa of? When he was a baby, what his mother had to do, putting him into the river. When it talks about <coughs> the issue of uh, the, the, the second story, what was it? Killing the boy. What does it remind Musa of? And yeah, when he had... When he, had, he hit the guy and killed him by accident, and he had to go into hiding. The, the third story, what was it? About the wall. What does that remind Musa of? When he was, what? When he helped out the girls by giving them the, uh, water, watering their animals for them, and then going to work after that. So that reminds, it reminds him of three, of, you know, life-changing experiences that happened in the life of Musa, alayhi salam. The fourth story, the story of the Qurnayn, or the Qurnayn, uh, it shows us obviously the issue of power, of being a leader. And many of us like to talk, and I mentioned this here before in a lecture, we like to talk, if I was in charge, if I was a leader, I would do this. But once you get the power and you sit on the, the throne, huh, it becomes much more difficult, much more difficult. 
And it doesn't matter which level you're at. We could say here in Fanar, if I was the head of Fanar, I would do this and this and this. As soon as you become in charge, you can say it's actually not that easy. I mean, Skeen, who was ever in charge, I could see some of the difficulties he was facing. Because you didn't know until you were sitting on the chair. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to show us here what does it mean to be a leader? Being the leader is an ob objective that we should, so it's not an objective, it's a means. A means to do what? To serve the people. This is what it means to be a leader. How can I serve the people? How can I serve my people? How can I serve my society? How can I serve my community? How can I serve my business? This is what it means to be a leader. It's to be a, a servant. And that's why many of the, the leaders you'll find, they call themselves a khadim, a servant, because that's the reality of what a leader should be. Even though some of them just put the name, and it's not a reality. But nonetheless, that's what it should be. You should be a servant. You should be a servant of, uh, uh, in assistance and helping others. Also, obviously, it shows us that one of the clear, clear objectives is to establish justice. Is to establish justice. If you look at one of the stories, and his story, when he found the people, لا يكادون يفقهون قولا. This قوم, these people, they could barely understand his speech. What does that show us about these people? They said that they weren't very knowledgeable. They were ignorant. And that's one of the reasons they were being attacked. They couldn't figure out themselves how to put a barrier between themselves and between uh, the attack that they were having from yeah, Jews or Majuj. Huh? They're being attacked and they don't know how to deal with it. They don't have the knowledge of how to build and what to do to protect themselves. And to be more prepared, to be more clever so they don't fall into the same trap because they keep doing it to them time and time again. They came to him and they said, should we make for you kharjan? Fahal naj'alaka kharjan? We'll make something for you, help you out, give you some money, give you something in return. If you'll build between us and them, said then, put the, build the barrier between us and them, help us. What did he reply to them right away? Qala ma makkani fihi rabbi khair. What my Lord has given me is better. And this teaches that a leader is not after what? He's not after financial gains, not his objective. The fact he has to live okay, he has to live comfortable, no problem with that. But obviously his objective is not to gather money and have the people not have as we see in many societies. He doesn't care about the money. And look at the cleverness right away of the leader right away. What did he do? He could have built it with himself with his own soldiers. He has his army with him. They have the ability, they have the means to do it. But what did he do then? He wants to empower the people to teach them to help themselves. So he said to them, فَعِينُونِي بِقُوَّةً yeah, Help me with power. Give me manpower. And then bring me the hadith. Bring me the metal and we'll start working. I'll show you what to do. I'll teach you how to build it. And we'll work with you as well. Work together. And they're going to realize these ignorant people now who didn't have this knowledge, this is actually not that difficult. We can do it ourselves now. SubhanAllah. The, the expression, what does it say? Teach a man to fish. These expressions, we think it's, it's like, Oh, it's just something, it's just something you say. But it has meaning. Uh, you come and teach the people how to fish. They'll eat for a lifetime. Help them one time, they're only going to eat for the day, right? The same meaning here now. So, I don't need your money, but I'm going to teach you how to do it yourself. Bring your manpower. Your, your people work with us. We'll work with you and show you how to do it. And this is from the, the beauty of what it means to be a true leader and have true success upon earth when establishing justice and empowering the people. At the end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions two different groups. One of them, الَّذِينَ ضَلَّ صَعْيُهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا The ones whose efforts will be totally lost in this dunya. And what do these people think about themselves? وَهُمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ and they believe that they are doing good work. They're doing a good thing. But the reality is that they've gone astray from the path. Just like the ones who said, إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْلِحُونَ The corruptors upon earth. They say that we're reformers. We're doing good upon earth. SubhanAllah. Allah said, أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمْ الْمُفْسِدُونَ SubhanAllah. And indeed that they are the corruptors upon the earth. وَلَكِنْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ They don't feel it. They don't understand it. So these people, subhanAllah, the same. They're making all of this effort and they think they're doing a good thing, but they've gone astray in this in this dunya, and they're from the aqsarina amala. They're from the true losers, Yom al Qiyamah, who will come with nothing to benefit from all of the effort they made in this dunya. But then Allah mentions another group to us. Inna Ladina Aminu wa Amilu Salihati. 
Indeed, those who believe and do good deeds. Kanat lahum, they have what? Jannatul Firdosi Nuzula. They will have the Jannah of Firdos as their lodging, as their place where they will be living. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all from them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah help us all to be from those who read the Quran and reflect on its meanings. Not just those who read for the barakah. Alhamdulillah, you're going to get the barakah. You're going to get the ajr. You're going to get the reward. And that's something that's good, alhamdulillah. But the true benefits of the Quran is when you start to go deep into the meanings of the Quran. And so some of the scholars, they gave a beautiful example. They said that the Quran is like a bahar, like a sea. If you are on top of the water and you put your line in, you go fishing a bit, are you going to benefit from the sea? You're going to benefit. But just some basic stuff. If you want the true treasures, what do you have to do? You have to dive. You have to go deep. That's where you find the pearls. That's where you find the big fish. They get the big money. You have to go deep into the sea. Way out in the sea. And then you have to go deep into the water to find those big fish that are going to bring the big money. You have to find the treasures and the, the jewels underneath the water. And that's the Quran as well. The deeper you go and the deeper you go into, in, inside, the deeper you reflect, the more meanings and benefits you're going to find in Shalom Ta'ala. And this is just some, just a little bit we mentioned, Surah al kaf we could reflect on it for days and what we gain from all of these amazing ayat and the stories in the surah. So inshallah ta'ala, hopefully those of you who haven't read it yet, tomorrow inshallah ta'ala, if you're reading it on Jum'ah, that we will inshallah benefit and make it more of a reflection and not just a quick, I have to get to the end to get the ajr and read all 110 verses as fast as possible. Jazakumullah khairan, Allah knows best, Allah alam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Muhammad.